Philippines. And the Captain Onuma sends out and out of the warriors, came out the Filipino warriors armed with a uh, sword and spear and shield. And they lose one Spanish soldier doing this, and they lose one Filipino. That's pr probably the first usage of Filipino martial arts on this continent. Uh, the man of John Lafitte, the pirate. And the command of John Lafitte was a, a pirate in the Barbateria bi area. And in his command, he had over 3,000 pirates. And 3,000 pirates, out of the 3,000 pirates, 400 are Filipino. This is oral Filipino history that's been passed down. Uh, in 1898, the Americans come in, and in 1898, uh, starts the movement of uh, the Filipino martial arts because it was uh, repressed by the Spanish at that time. If you were caught practicing that art, you were put to death at that time period, the way the, the story handed down to me. So the Manila Galleon routes are very, very important. 1565, but what many people don't know, 80% of the Filip uh, Manila Galleon route on the boats were 80% are Filipino, 20% are Spanish. So they always fought for the Spanish in different countries fighting off the Dutch the English, the Portuguese. And so when we come down to this martial art, I'll, I'll take out my equipment while I'm talking. Okay, so we never separate boxing away from martial art. And uh, we never separate it from the weaponry. But Kali has uh, 12 areas. I've been very fortunate. My father was Secretary of Treasury of the Philippine community. At that time, Stockton had the largest Filipino population in the United States. Large in Louisiana, larger than San Francisco. It was a mecca of the Filipino population. My father, as I said before, was uh, Secretary of Trade of the Philippine community. He introduced me to most of my instructors. Uh, been able to research 32 instructors. It was so interesting for me because every system is so uniquely different. There's not one system that's the same. They're all different. So the, what I like to do is teach in 12 areas. So as I talk and as I move, okay, uh, I'm going <laughs> to... I was going to have a PowerPoint, but I decided not to do it because I had pictures of different people. Uh, and so we divided it into 12 areas. And the first area is sometimes called sensilia. It is the use of just one weapon. So usually, if you learn the stick, you are learning the sword. So a plain stick like this, okay, is uh, one of the things they use. But in reality, the stick trains you to use different weapons. I couldn't bring out my whole collection, but this is Barong. This is used in Philippines. You have another one. You have Longha. Okay. You have different type of weapons. I brought this out to show you that when you learn the stick, you are actually learning a martial art. I couldn't bring all the weapons out, but, I, <laughs> but I'm going to show you why the two. So the first category is single death. I'm going to use Joel Clark as my assistant. He, Joel has a, been assisting me for the last 12 years. Uh, Position. So when we learn the stick at this range, this is what we call sombrata. And I'm just going to show you why we work this. Okay? When we work out of here like this, like that, we work in. We come back to that position. We can go down low like this. Back, back here, back here, back. So I'm going to break down about disarming. Disarming with the single stick, there are many types. Okay? All right. So a lot of people use the vine disarm, which is like that. Others use the vine disarm, but they come back to this side here and take it out like that. Others snake counterclockwise, while others will disarm clockwise. Okay? I'm just going to show you. Then, then you have people that don't like that method, they use this method. Okay? okay? So the hand position is interchangeable. Okay? When you move this line here, a lot of people, this one will bounce. See, so that's one of the disarms. So these are called soplet. Disarming, you know, I didn't want to go toward you. <laughs> <laughs> so you have uh, different disarms. I'll just show you how they do it. So you, you can use it out here. That's one disarm. Some people like to go on the top. Usually you have 12 angles of attack. Every Filipino system has a different number of attack. We have blows that go diagonal, like that, down here. You have blows that go uppercut. You have blows that go horizontal. And you have four blows that go vertical. That's it. When they put it in configuration, that's usually how they work it. The hand position here, this is what we call floretti. And we disarm also on the backhand side. That's your backhand side. That would be one. Not like that. These are different parts. So this is the first category, single stick. If we transfer this, we can transfer this to the blade. We're going to go slow so nobody will get hurt. OK. <laughs> So it, if you notice closely, it is the same principle when you go back here. 
back. You can work it around here. Back in, sorry, Joe, I took back here. I don't want to let it fly. Away. But this is the fit. These are what we call soplic techniques. Obviously, you cannot snake like this because it's going to cut your arm. But when you use this, you notice there's a cut in the neck. There's a cut in the neck. That's why they can use it with. The Spanish weren't stupid. They 80% of Manila galleon is filled 80% of Filipino. Even the uh, ships of uh, what they call Discovery had a lot of Filipinos in it. And they use them as soldiers. Now, the other category that they have is what we call Bistani Daga or Garuti Daga. There are some systems that use the flat stick. This is popular among the, the, uh, the Ilungos. The Cebuano one is a little bit wider. But your same principle here. OK, I'll just go to the dagger. I'm going to go very slow here so you can see what they're doing. This is a method they use. See how you wrap the weapon here? And then you throw the guy here on the stage. OK, all right. You, uh, others, when they wrap, they invite the hand here. See, that's the throw here. We're not going to throw because there's no mats. <laughs> and there's a, there's a stage here. So we use this. Some people will use it this way. The same technique that I did before, see, so can be used the same way. That's a lock. One that was very popular by Flora Villabreo at this time, Grandmaster, he used to use this one. See this? This is what we call number 12 in the Villabreo system. That's a double. However, when you see it like that, people say, what is that for? OK, that's, so the other category is what we call double stick. The Maccabees always use this. Uh, I'm just going to show you some combination. This, as you already know, is heaven six. This is standard six. This is earth six. Okay, okay, and this is umbrella. You know, position you like that. These are just combination. And then after you, uh, there are uh, literally 1,026 combinations on the 26 count family, on the eight count family alone. And okay, now when you strike here. I'll do this very slow, because so you, you already always monitor that hand. So if that stick comes, see, that hit here, you can do like that. So you have to learn how to use a double stick. This will also be uh, transferred into sword, sword and shield method. I'm rushing this, because I know I only have 25 minutes. <laughs> OK, so this is the third category. You have a uh, stick and dagger, which will translate during the time of the Spanish as to the uh, espada y dagger. This is the espada. And during the Spanish time, see, they, they like this because this automatically, see, will actually stab here. See, the hand, is really, the hand will be here. The hand will be like that. And then you're going to get the, whole, the position here. So this is a very common one that they use at the time. Because uh, every Filipino at that time wanted to be, belong to the, to the army. They call soldados. Because they can carry weapons. If you're a commoner, you cannot carry the use of arms. OK, so you have the other category. So the other category we have is double daga or single daga. I'm going to go through a knife float, which many people know. You see the here, the hand position? See the hand position here? And when I go like that, these are, this is the flow here so you can get the, like that. This is the, da, the hand flow, OK? So this also will come with the doubly daga. Come back here. I'm sorry. OK. All right. So the doubly die, you notice there's a slash when we ride that. I already zoned away from the air. You see the hand position here? You come out. So the hand position is many different ways. If Joel were to use this grip and I come up here, this is policy drill. So I'm going to do this slow so you can see it. See the hand position? See the hand position over here? It's out. Take this one out, Joel. Take this one out, Joel. Okay. Now we're empty hands. OK, now, where does the boxing come in? The boxing comes in, uh, at the time, if they wanted to come to America, there is an art called Panantukan. But they also call it Suntukan. And they don't want to call it Suntukan because uh, one of my instructors, Lukalakai, says they will confuse that for Shotokan, which is a Japanese system. But Suntukan is a Filipino martial art, a Filipino form of boxing. It is based on the dagger. See? So that's, you can see where you come back to uppercuts, two uppercuts, bolo, punch. That's the format. So all the movements are taken from the diagram. OK, I'm just going to show you some basic pun and 
we monitor that hand here. That hand has to come here. I know it has to come here. That will give me that shot here. Which will give me that shot here? See, so we're always monitoring. They grab more. But they said, if you want to come to America, then you can't grab, you can't elbow, you can't knee. Those techniques. I don't know if you noticed, but I'll try to explain this. When I monitor that hand, there's an eye poke. You can't do that in regular boxing. See? There is a, here. Over here, it hits the breaking nerve, or what we call the ulnar nerve, which is the crazy bone. I already know that that hand is going to hit the other breaking nerve, that's the throat back, and that's going to give me the shot back here. Okay, this will give you an idea of, of what is Ponatukan. Like I said, we're going to very rapid. So when we have uh, a next weapon, I just want to bring this out. Okay? Usually, we don't have to look for the weapons, but right now we do. So I'm going to have a little Joel do this for me. You see, because if this is a, in system, system, this is angle one, angle two, angle three, angle four, angle five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, and ten, eleven, and twelve. See? So if you look closely, this is still number one. That's number two. If I hit number one, he still can destroy it. Like that, see? Hit number two, he can still destroy it. If I hit number three, he can still destroy it. Number four, he can still destroy it. And then go five. See? So you follow the foreman, the hand of the hand blade. Okay, then you have the use of the alarm. Every Filipino knows what this is. <laughs> Am I correct? Right? So in Malong, a lot of times we weren't allowed to teach this. The Filipino martial art has always been very, very secretive and very, very, but they always taught it outside the Filipino race. They could be African American, they could be Asian, they could be Hispanic. They just had to be close friends of the family. That is the only stipulation. It has always been taught outside the Filipino race. So I'm going to show you in slow motion. You notice how you march the hand. You see the, where the lock to the hand position here. I'm going to go very slow because there's no mat. It's like that. So we use this a lot. But most people don't know what we're doing. They think, <laughs> they just think that's some, but actually it is used. Let's do another one very slowly. All right, you notice how the elbow will hit, strike elbow. You see how I come here? When I wrap it, I'm going to turn this very, oh, watch out, Joel, let's go. See the hand position like that? Okay, this will give you a, an idea how the Filipino march art works. Because you have double stick, you have a single stick. So it's interchangeable the way we use it. And once we understand, it's like uh, a lot of locking, right? Did you have cross the You see the hand here? They used to pinch our nipple, <laughs> and then move the base like that, and the hit will perform, see? That's usually what we used to do. So a lot of the, the movements that we have, I'm, I'm trying to race with time. <laughs> OK. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the movement here, I'm going to show you a picture. Because long before the UFC started, I had a, they already were doing this. Only problem, they didn't get any money. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to show you this picture because uh, I always found this very fat. And this before, they used to have this thing, it was outlawed in 1920 in Hawaii. And uh, this is the picture, I don't know if you can see it. This is a match, this is Floraville Braille and Francisco Raduno. And this here is no armor. You can punch, you can kick, you can elbow, you can knee, you can kick. If you can close the kicking, the stick range. If. But the stick range is hard. But it allowed close quarter. Because the stick, again, Joe, I'm going to do the stick. You have a, no stick. You see the hand position here? You see this throw shot? That's a lock. If I move their base here, that's another lock. Like that. So you can use this. See, many people don't realize that you can use this for many different sources. So we lock. I just, you take. All right. He has taken a lot of shots from me through the last door. <laughs> it's very hard to. Uh, okay. It's uh, very difficult to be the fall guy to demonstrate. It's very, very difficult. And I know it is. See? But I'm going to show this just a couple more. Can you see this hand position here? See when I, when I switch the base, see the hit here? You see how I crank the shoulder? That's a lock. See, this is an arm break. That's a choke. See? So they lock with the stick on the ground. Joe, I'm going to ask you to take your shoes off so I can explain something to you. Okay? Now I'm going to do this. 
one of the biggest compliments I had in Hawaii. They say, you, they go, this is way back in the 80s. Says, Dan, your Holly students have Filipino movements. <laughs> a Holly, if you get an occasion of Hawaii, it means a, a Caucasian. It means without breath. But, and they, they compliment us. They move. But if you look at Joel here on the ground, I'm going to let Joel show you on the ground, because you will go to the ground. So when you, you, you use your hand. See, this is his hand. Now watch how they duplicate it with the feet. See, same thing, right? Do the next one, Joel. Watch how they come back and push. Watch how the foot comes out. See, same principle. He's going to pop up with his foot. He's going to do it first with the hand principle of the hand. Now, when he does this, see, he's going to come out here. He's going to slam dunk it on the ground with his hand. With his hand first. So I'm going to see the principle. See the hand position when he scoops it down? See? OK, now watch his foot. See? So they train their foot. In this way, uh, they're very, very similar to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Their feet are like hands. Professor Sauer is in the audience right now. He's one of my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructors. So <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to show you. Uh, uh, there so when you take it all the way over with the hand, just take it all nice and slow. See how he takes it all the way over from the hands? Now watch, his feet will duplicate that motion. Watch, see? It's going to come out here like that. Once I go, they have pretty much the same trip. You can trip me. OK, like this. OK, you see the shot? <laughs> it's going to go here like that. See? That's the hand position. And then they come up to that position, OK? Uh, I was going to do this thing in a suit. And I thought, <laughs> I was telling you, there's no way you can do it in a suit and tie. But uh, this will give you a little bit of uh, the understanding of the Filipino martial arts. It is so vast. Uh, I was going to make a PowerPoint, but I said, no, it's going to take too time. I wanted to give credit, but these are the people I trained with. And through the years, it marked 34 different instructors I trained in the United States. And uh, when people ask me who's better, I say, it's, it's like music. If you ask the guy, what is your favorite song, it's going to be different. If you ask any person, what's your favorite food? Can, if I said, what's your favorite fast food? Some guy would say McDonald's, the other guy would say Jack in the Box, the other guy would say Burger King, and the other guy would say uh, In-N-Out Burger. Right? <laughs> right? So you have so many different, I'm not saying you, for you to take that. I'm saying that <laughs> that is uh, why there's so many ways. So in the Filipino martial arts, I never like to compare different instructors. Uh, I had the sign instructors. For science, you have a... Uh, Cibuanos, Bulohanos, Warai Warai, Ilongos, and uh, you have the South, Southern Philippines, uh, like the Villabreo system, they have a lot of Silat, Kunta, which is mainly an uh, Islamic system. Uh, you have people that, from the North, like the Tagalog people, they have their arts. The Ilocanos, they have their art. And they're all good. My father used to tell me, he said, I'm going to take you to this Filipino man. The first thing you got to do, Dan, is close your mouth and open your mind. So don't say I learned that before. Don't say I had that before. You just teach it, whoever is teaching it to you, and don't say anything. It's some good advice my father uh, gave me because they're all very, very good. They all have different uh, uh, methods, and you can study with this. Uh, something my father taught me too, because when I first started training in the Philippine martial arts, my dad said, "I'm going to." He's going to give me an education. And Ed Parker, my Kempo Karate teacher, says, uh, I want you to go there and study your own culture. So I went. I had seen it as a child. I watched them practice with the long asparagus knife. I remember the clang, 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 clang. I saw that at five years old. But I never really understood it, really, until about 19 years old. That's a long time, right? Because it's really a very scientific art. There are many ways they do it. But uh, I always liked that. Uh, the thing that amazed me is when I, my dad took me to these guys, these five, what you now would call elderly people. They were in their 50s, 59, about three of them in the 60s. The rest of them was in their 70s. And I go, why is my father taking me to these people? They're old. Uh, because right now I'm 74, so I know. <laughs> so, uh, so at that time, yeah. I, I don't consider it old, but, but and, I, and I looked it around, I go, my gosh, what can they teach me? They don't have a black belt. First mistake I made. <laughs> Second mistake I made is they don't even have uniforms. How can these guys be good? <laughs> Second mistake I made. Appearance was a third. They walked out to train me. They're in a Hawaiian shirt. 
cut off Levi's, flip flop, and three of them were smoking this Tuscany like this, <laughs> right? That probably was the most humbling day of my life. I mean, they just, I just felt like quitting uh, because they were, particularly in the weaponry phase, they were just so, uh, I was so intrigued of the skill. And I don't think they knew what the skill was. But I was very uh, impressed because, uh, as my father says, you thought that black belt would mean something. It doesn't mean anything to these guys. And it, they, were, they were just so right and so on. And they just, I never judge a person now by, by the, de the degree, and I never judge a person by the uniform he's wearing. They can have a flashy uniform, but maybe he doesn't have any skill. They can have two, three, and I found that out even in the real world, right? I'm sure you know that no matter how many degrees you hold, you realize that's just for a time. Because somebody's always coming up, and knowledge is constantly on the go. It's constantly moving. As we speak now, the martial art changes. Every generation. Can you say, well, you know, George Washington was a father of our country. He had an army. Let's not, let's follow his way. Let's wear the same uniforms that George Washington do, use the same rifle, same ammunition, same tactics. Take them abroad. They're going to die. <laughs> because you have to keep up. Everything changes. There's, uh, everything evolves in martial art. The Philippines is unique. It has a strong Indian background from, from India. It has a strong Chinese background. It has a strong Indo-Malayan background. Right? It has a strong Mexican background, Aztec. People look at me, come on, get out of here. Right. I don't know if people know that. They took Aztecs from the New World, that time it was the New World, brought them to the Philippines and dispersed them among the Philippines. Then they took a lot of troublemakers from the Philippines and dispersed them in Mexico. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> they, they're not even aware of that. This goes on for three centuries. Now, a lot of Filipinos did drum ship because, I mean, they're dying, right, for, for finding the, the Dutch and the English and Portuguese. Remember, this is what we call the expansion and Europeanization of Southeast Asia. And as they're dying, different countries say, hey, let's just jump ship. This looks like a nice thing. That's Louisiana. So they jumped off ship in Mexico. My Thai boxer, uh, John Chai, goes, he came back one time. He says, you know, I went to, to do a seminar in Acapulco, Dan. You can't believe who was in my seminars. And I don't know right away what he's going to say. He said, you had Filipinos. He said, but they're not from Tijuana. They're not from San Diego. They live in the Acapulco, Mexico, uh, in part of Mexico. This is something I, I just wanted to share with you because I've learned so much from my students have taught me. Actually, the, the, the movement in the United States, you can find the Filipino martial arts in the film industry. They might not call it Filipino martial art because I have at least 50 students in stunts, big names in stunts. They, any name, major picture, you'll find one of, one of my students choreographing it. And a lot of it is Filipino martial art. Where you really see it is in the law enforcement agency. What we call the, uh, without giving away different positions here, right? There's a lot of people who are more in, name the alphabet, they have it. DAA, ATF, right? FBI. You'll find the Filipino martial arts in. Period. Where you will find it, and you won't think so, that when Dallas had a winning team, right? We taught an exercise <laughs> called the Huba. So what uh, my student did, Bob Ward, who was the conditioning coach for the Dallas Cowboys, we took the basic huba drill. I'm, I'm, we're just going to go through slow. This is the huba. It's a very basic drill like this. Back here. See the hand position? OK. We took this out, and we took this position. Just one more time so you can. You see the hand position? Take this one out. Okay. And when you go like that, see, this is also called huba. See? Right, see? This is all huba. But they call it uh, applied, what's that name now? Applied, applied, sport. applied sport. They don't call it huba. But it's actually Filipino martial arts, and a lot of professional football teams now do it. But it started with the Dallas Cowboys way back in, uh, I believe, like in the, in the 70s and the 80s when Randy White. In fact, uh, there was three, the Dallas had three people in the double digits and sacking the quarterback. All three came up to me and said that the Filipino martial arts is responsible for them learning sensitivity. Because sensitivity is so important. When you fight from long range, you're trying to shorten the response time to a visual stimulus. But when you fight a close quarter, you're trying to shorten response time to tactile. When you go tactical, you don't have to. Forgive me, it's going to be a little bit rambling. But I didn't really, even though I've been in the front row for 40 years, I didn't know how much 
prejudice of being against Filipino. Um, and I'm looking at the 1933 note in the thing about when Filipinos were trying to marry outside of the Filipinos race. And then I happen to know from my own experience that 1972 were thereabouts, Love versus Virginia, when they finally said, the Supreme Court finally said, hey, you can marry whoever you want to marry. My question is basically, how did the Filipinos deal with that from 1933 to 1974, Love versus Virginia? And is there still any of that prejudice and stuff now? And anybody or all of you can answer it, you know, in the, in the thing. Do you want to get back to that? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the, the case that ruled, actually, um, I think what you're referring to is the California legislation. And um, the case that ruled it was the Roldan uh, versus Los Angeles County. So that it was ruled that Filipinos were Malay, and therefore Malay cannot inter, um, intermarry. So how they, a lot of the Filipinos, a lot of the Manongs would deal with it if, is they would go to either to Mexico um, and get married and then come back to California, or would they would go to neighboring states uh, who, which did not have anti-miscegenation laws. One of the places that they always went to was Lordsburg, uh, New Mexico. One is there was no miscegenation law there, and one is it was really easy to get to. Because don't forget that if they left their work to get married elsewhere, that means they didn't get any money. Uh, they didn't get wages for that. And so they would go to uh, these other places, but then they'd always come back. Um, but I think one of the, one of, um, but then, you know, both partners would face hostilities from both communities. So that was also difficult. So there was one in which, you know, you got married elsewhere, right, and then came back to your community, and, um, and then there was the hostilities there. Yeah. So the, the, the California Supreme Court actually um, ruled anti-miscegenation laws um, unconstitutional in the 1940s. <laughs> but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't really until 1967 with the Supreme Court ruling that uh, that those anti-miscegenation laws really started um, uh, falling down. And uh, today, you know, we, we, we don't have those laws in effect today, um, and it's a different situation. Uh, Filipinos have the, one of the highest outmarriage rates of any of the Asian populations in the U.S. Um, so we, we are in a much different uh, setting today. And let me just follow up to what you were saying, it, it, because Filipinos do have a high out marriage rate. So, you know, to follow up with what Guru Dan was saying, you know, there's a fluidity with who defining, right, a Filipino American. So, um, you know, we can't define it by language, by being born elsewhere, even by birthright or by ethnicity. And, you know, it's very complicated, but also rich issue um, for, for Filipino Americans. Okay. This side? This is a question for Mr. Inosanto. Um, having trained and having trained with uh, a number of the big names throughout the ages, uh, have you started to notice if there was any way, any sort of a trend in um, in what martial arts were aiming towards over the years, or or even changing more recently from when you started? Uh, I like to think that people are more open-minded now, and they uh, will train in uh, many different di disciplines. Uh, this is even true in the Filipino martial arts. You wouldn't have the signs of training the Ilocanos at one time. Or an Ilocano would not train with, uh, with a Tagalog. But uh, everyone, is, if he's intelligent, will uh, borrow or learn from all different uh, groups. And uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question properly, but uh, uh, my people, I, say I owe a lot to my students because they, they know that the value that somebody has the strength and weakness in a particular area. So uh, the students I have, I like to think they're very intelligent. They train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they train in uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, they, they train in shoot wrestling, they train in Muay Thai, they train in Bando, they, they train in uh, Penjok Silat, Indonesian, Malaysian. So the, the people now, are, they're like football coaches where you prepare for what is out there, no matter what your formation is, whether it be a split tee, a wing tee, a slot tee, they prepare for that formation. Therefore, martial artists now, of this generation, are more intelligent. The, the non-martial art community is far more intelligent now than it was, say, back in the 60s. Because they learned, they have the, 
videos now they have uh, at one time you couldn't switch from system to system and now all you have to do is switch to YouTube because all you have to <laughs> you pretty much will find anything on the internet so you, uh, the the knowledge now is, is so people are not as hostile in my generation they're very hostile between the Koreans and the Japanese they're very hostile you know, they never look at each other but now people are more intelligent they're going to learn from each other thank you very much Thanks. thank you question actually has to do uh, somewhat with Manny Pacquiao as well. Uh, in advertisement for uh, his upcoming fight that ran into a warrior statesman that he is the next generation warrior king. And I was wondering if there was any more history you can enlighten us on about Filipino warrior statesmen or also if you have an opinion as to why you think there's been sort of a decline in that where modern day politicians are not typically known for their athletic powers or their combat training. Why that why there's been a separation <laughs> uh, I, th I think uh, uh, there is a, they, they're a warrior, but in another way. We fight different things in a different ways, but the, the warrior mentality has always existed in the Philippines, as I said before, you know, uh, the Spanish uh, knew that. That's why 80% that's why of the Manila Galleon is uh, Filipino. Probably to time you get in the 1900s, probably 90%, they trusted him so much. Uh, many many uh, Spanish writers wrote that they were uh, great statement. Like Dr. Jose Rizal is uniquely different because uh, he's a typical Filipino. He's one-fourth Chinese, one-fourth Japanese, one-fourth Spanish, and one-fourth Indian. And he was a great politician. The only thing he spoke the truth, that's why he was executed. So do we have strength and weaknesses in, in, in character uh, in politicians, and we have it in martial art. It, to me, it's the same thing. It's just, uh, you're, always, you're always competing. Uh, you, you will never find two people in agreement in any one subject, even in the same system of martial art, and even in politics, for sure. There cannot be, because we, we see differently. And that's the beauty of it, I think, is that you see differently. If everybody thought the same, it would be a very uh, boring world, I think. <laughs> so I think it's uh, important that uh, it, politicians are warriors, but in, in a different way. A scientist is a warrior. In most martial arts societies, the physician is a warrior. He just fights disease, a man. So we all, we're warriors in any one subject we're in. You know, name the subject, you could, you, there's, a warrior, there's a warrior class there also. Thank you. All right, over here. Uh, yeah, my name is Wesley Chrysostomo, and I'm a practitioner of uh, Eskrima, or Arnis. And uh, some of my students are in here with us today. They have high regards for Guru Dani Nasanto. Um, we always wanted to find out, this is a very tricky question. You may answer it or not, but we wanted to ask, where are the origins of the word Arnis, Eskrima, and Kali came from? Because there seems to be a lot of uh, issues or problems with regards to the origin of those uh, words. Thank you. Well, I was told this. Uh, I use Eskrima. I use Arnes. Because some of my teachers use Arnes. Some use Eskrima. Arnes and Eskrima are a Spanish word. The older generation sometimes call up, uh, Kali Kali, uh, they call it Kali Radman, Kali Rogan. The southern Philippines always practiced Silat, and they practiced Kuntao. What happened here in America, there was an intermarriage between the groups, and they started to spread it. So I would use the word Kali, because Flora Villabreo in 1973 told me to use Kali. And I'm not going <laughs> to argue. Uh, I am not going to argue with Flora Villabreo. Villabreo like, so he told me, in fact, when, he first, when I first met him, he said, you use a screamer. Why do you use a screamer? I said, well, that's what my instructors called it. So why do you use Arnes? He says, you call it Kali. That is a name. He says, a screamer is a Spanish word. Arnes is a Spanish word. He says, use Kali. I want you to use the word Kali. And with that, in 1973, I have never stopped using it because of uh, Flora Villabreon and the other person that was because of uh, Johnny Lacasa and my other instructor was L Lucky Lukai Lukai. Everybody in the Filipino martial art knows each other. They might not get along with each other, 
but everybody knows of everybody. There's a lot of people that brought the, the Filipino martial arts here. You know, in the East Coast here, you had Edmonti, you have uh, Ali Hugahi, Tuhan Ali Hugahi. You have the, the Sayat family, Alentencio family. You have the Bayat family in the North. You have uh, Fred Lazo. The San Francisco area, you can, uh, my, son, my instructor was forming, for but they, some of them use a screamer, and they always, they, they have been arguing, this is nothing new, they were already arguing that in 1973, but because my father always told me to shut my mouth, <laughs> right, so when I wrote my first book, he says, don't call it Kali, don't call it a screamer, don't call it Arnest, don't call it Kuntown, don't call it Ceylon, don't call it Kali Rodman, Kali Rogan, and Kali Kali. So I looked at my dad, and he said, well, what do you want me to call it, dad? He says, call it. Filipino martial art, period. And that's why I use it. My father, Afora del Brea. Okay, I thank you very much. Okay. Did you have anything to add, Rosie? No, that's, that's pretty much, my grandmaster is uh, Joseph T. Ariola, and he calls it Kali as well, from Ben Marcusa and also from Villa Brill, so that is, that is really what we um, adhere to as well. Great. We're here. First of all, I uh, want to uh, Thank uh, God, it's a great honor to have him here. Uh, I'm a former student of Michael Kripke. Um, as, as far as um, its philosophy goes, how is it Filipino's philosophy different from uh, Bruce Lee's uh, philosophy as far as the martial arts go? Uh, is there any difference if there is? Yeah, I, I like, uh, I was very fortunate to train under Bruce Lee. I get very emotional, so I hope I don't cry. But uh, uh, I taught him the nunchucks, but we don't call it nunchucks. We call it tabak toyo. That's a term to be used in, in the Villabreo Lagusa family. Uh, and that's the nunchucks. And I taught it to Bruce Lee, and he liked it. You know? In the beginning, he didn't like it. He says it's a piece of junk, but he's kept on using it in the movies. So I figured, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Uh, I think he must have liked it. I, I taught him double stick, and I taught he's my instructor, but I shared the art of a Kali and a Screamer Ernest with Bruce Lee, both the single stick and double stick, and uh, definitely the Tabak Tuyuk, which the Okinawans call it uh, the, the Nunchak or Nunchako. But the, the Okinawans uh, are the last ones to get it. A lot of southern uh, Okinawans, they look very, very similar to the Filipinos. Because a lot of the melees were, uh, they are, they're always caught in southern Formosa, for southern Okinawa. And as they move down, like even the, the Sai is, is an Indonesian Malaysian weapon. But uh, with Bruce Lee, the reason why they're so closely enacted, because they're free thinkers. They're not going to use it if it doesn't work. And that's the way Bruce Lee was. He, he said, we're going to test it, we're going to, you got to test it, you have to field test it to see if it works. And it will work under some, some uh, circumstances. It will not work under other circumstances. So definitely, uh, they think a lot. Uh, a lot of Filipinos. We all, Lee, uh, Tuangahi told me that, uh, that when, they, when they had a problem in uh, doing the, the counters to a defense, they would stay up to 2 and 3 and 4 in the morning trying to figure out what is the best solution if that position happened, uh, whether it was stick and dagger or whether dagger, single dagger, or empty hands. And so uh, that's probably why it's very, I don't know if I'm answering the question properly, but that's why the system is very good, because he was a free thinker, and most Filipinos are very free thinking. You know, they, they already have a Persian influence, they have Indian influence, they have Chinese influence. You have the, the New World influence coming with the, uh, with the Aztecs. You, you have definitely the European use of arms. The Jesuits were the ones that brought a lot of European arms. So, in our stick and dagger, particularly the most I study, it has 10 to 20 percent European, right? So uh, they pretty much learn from each other. If they didn't have that technique, they were going to have a solution for that particular attack or technique. And that's why it, it, it's the same thinking the way Bruce says. We, we test it out and see if it works, and then we test it again. So his thing is research, experiment, create. Research, experiment, and develop. Right? Because you have to tailor make the system to fit yourself. I suppose it's just it's how you apply apply things to make it work. Yeah, it's uh, applicable. You have to really uh, apply it because what works for one practitioner may not work for another practitioner. Any art teaches that. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu teaches that. If you have a bigger instructor, he's 230 pounds, his technique is going to be different, right? 
So you have to adapt the technique that fits you. I love to play basketball, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> right? I didn't grow past the fifth grade. I was center of, the, of my fifth grade basketball team, but, so I have to learn how to adapt. Likely, if you're 280 pounds and you want to be a jockey, there's no horse going to carry you. Right? So you have to adapt for the, uh, the attributes that God gave you. And that's where I think where the key is that you find what works for you. And you learn from so many people. You, you always have to come. I always tell my students, you want to be always white belt mentality. Always be a white belt because a white belt is always hungry. Once you become black belt, because sometimes you can become complacent and the stomach comes out to here sometimes, you know. <laughs> so it's always good to be a beginner. Uh, I, I go on the mat every day and, and it, it, I, I don't feel like, if I get tapped out in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's a learning experience. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't even mind. It used to bother me a lot. I felt like I was a drummer more than a jiu-jitsu practitioner. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> it's, you, you just learn from that experience, and you constantly learn. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. My name is Miguel Severo. I trained in uh, Sayakali, and I, it's a multi-question and statement. My wife wanted to ask, uh, what is your diet? Because you look in fantastic shape for your age. <laughs> and is it martial arts? Has martial arts helped you stay in such great shape? And because there's oh, people that are 74 years old and they don't move at all like you. Oh, thank you. That's very, very flattering. <laughs> uh, I try to eat healthy, but uh, as Joel knows, I like to eat hamburgers once a week. Right. And I like French fries once a week, but if uh, I like to say in things that have been recommended to me, and uh, but it's hard to say in the path, very hard to say path. So I uh, I try to eat a balanced diet, you know, um, and then once in a week, on the weekends I get to eat meat. <laughs> so I, that's what I usually follow. Do you attribute your your health also to martial arts? Uh, yes, I, I uh, the martial arts. Uh, it keeps me alive, uh, keeps me constantly thinking. Uh, it's a really good art. I, it, it doesn't have to be even Filipino. It, it, all the martial arts seem to really keep the body in, the, in, in good shape. You know? And uh, I attribute the martial art training to that. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I, I'd just like to add, is sitting in the front row and watching Guru perform with, uh, and do the demo with Joe, he's talking the whole time. That's equivalent mm -hmm. to running and talking, running a marathon and talking. And he was barely, you, you could barely perceive that there was any, he wasn't out of breath at all. So that is, that is remarkable, right? And, um, and Joe, I know how hard it is to, because I was the, the fall guy a lot, so <laughs> I know how, it is, how hard it is to do that. So I'm, I'm 54, and um, I think the martial arts as well and diet is, is part of it, but if I could be in good shape at 74 as Guru is, then, then oh, that would really be something. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Guru, sir, um, as you said in your presentation, the Philippine martial arts are very deep. We as your second and third generation students are eager to drink from your well, but this month we saw the passing of two great masters. Yes. Dr. Ricketts and Mr. Le Guru Lagusta. Um, as the generations change, what are you and some of the other senior teachers doing to preserve the art so that as it's passed to the next generation, it's not diluted, things are not omitted, things are not looked over? Um, I, we, we have a curriculum. Most of my students know the curriculum. But on their certificate, particularly when they get to a phone structure, I said it's uh, their choice to even change the curriculum because it's important that they do change the curriculum and not keep it stagnant. It has to be constantly flowing. And anybody who's a full instructor, if you read your certificate, you'll say that you have the right to change the curriculum in any order. I don't think you're diluting it as you, you're, I like to think they're making it better. And that they should learn all the traditional things and the thing that we're, that's the, the set curriculum. And then they should expand on that. They should use their own creativity. Because I always believe that if three people are on the same subject matter, they have to come out with a better product. Uh, that's usually what I think Filipino mentality. They used to get together all the time. They said, well, how would you counter this? So, uh, so, so, so you're saying the Filipino mentality is a little different than say the Japanese mentality, which documents everything yeah. ad nauseum. 
Oh, <laughs> oh let, let, let me say that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I had trained in, in many Japanese systems, and I, I like it. And I like the way they teach it because it's regimentation from 1 to 30 or 1 to 100. But in the same token, I know that a person can take that material and make it better. It's, 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 I've, just, I've seen it in the past. I've seen it with my own students. They go, uh, Guru Dan, can I do it this way? And I go, wow, that's even better than I, than I showed him. Because that's the way uh, I think uh, knowledge should be made. You know, everyone's, uh, if not, we'd still be using uh, 78 and 45 RPM. Or we'd be still using A track or cassette players. <laughs> right? And if you don't keep up, like I didn't keep up. I remember when my students started buying me these uh, CDs. I didn't know what they were. I said, man, these 45s are terrible. Because <laughs> right? they don't have any grooves in it. See, that, I didn't keep up. And so, so I, I recognized from that, after I got these 30 uh, CDs, that they weren't uh, 45s. I, I, don't, I don't think you even know what a 45 is now, but our generation had a 45 record player. <laughs> and they had the grooves on it. So I didn't keep up. And so, and then I learned. And I didn't want to keep up with the computer. And uh, luckily, my students taught me how to use the computer. Or else I'd still be using the typewriter. That's what I told my wife. I said, I don't need the computer. Look, at, I can still use this Underwood typewriter. And I, then I was, oh my gosh, they can spell check. This is cheating. I mean, they, <laughs> this is, they have, you know, they can flip the pages. And I didn't realize that. So I said, I'm going to get it with the computer age. So if you don't stay up, you know, uh, you can fall behind technically. American football has changed dramatically. You know, in our days, if you made a mistake on the football field, they radio down to the bench. Nowadays, and they said, did you block that guy? And you go, yes. Then nowadays, they show it on instant replay. You didn't block the person. <laughs> so it's everything has evolved for the best, I'd like to think. And then some things, if it doesn't evolve for the best, then we just correct it. I hope, that, I, hope I answered the question properly. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more. Um, so in the spirit of why we're here uh, regarding the fight of Filipinos and everybody's presentations, which were uh, really good, I was just curious, um, how many on the panel have been in a street fight? <laughs> and could you tell us a story or two? Uh, well, well, mine is short. I've never been in a street fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Mine is even shorter. Me neither. <laughs> well, I lived in south st side of Stockton, south of Charterway, so that should tell you. <laughs> I won't go any farther than that. But uh, I, I hate fighting. I really do. But I know if you don't prepare yourself, you can get the worst of it. And I hate getting beat up. <laughs> but uh, you know, sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes you're not, you know, in, uh, in my hometown, that was just a, a way of life. And if you lived on the south side of Stockton, you could be in trouble, you know. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to tell you war stories, but uh, I've been hit on <laughs> many, many times, sometimes successful and sometimes not. <laughs> but uh, but uh, everything uh, you learn from that experience, everybody learns from that experience. Attempted to be mugged. Uh, I used to travel a lot internationally, and that's, this is when there used to be keys, not those car keys from hotels. Um, so you, you're always, for me, as I'm walking out. I mean, you can see right now that I have flat shoes on. It's because I know I'm going to be out late tonight, so I don't want to be caught up here. Um, so when there were keys, hotel keys, when I was in Germany, um, I, I would always make sure that I was, I was out, that I would have it in hand if I was walking in an area that I was unfamiliar with. And I was mugged, and I did use a key to um, scratch, definitely scratch, because there was blood on the key. And, and I think it's surprising that someone of my, my height in Germany would uh, retaliate. Um, so I don't know if it was successful, because I did get bruised um, and knocked around, but um, I was left uh, with everything that I came with and um, was able to walk away. Great. Uh, so thank you. Could I ask? Could I ask one quick um, last question? Sorry uh, to interrupt. Sorry, actually, I, Can I have I'm, I'm one more question. A, I'm getting a signal. Okay. Is, uh, <laughs> oh. 
Okay, one more. One, one more question, thank yeah. you. Uh, Guru, thank you first of all for all the great years of teaching. Uh, I did have a question you mentioned briefly, your dad. And I was wondering if you could tell us how your parents came to America, what initially brought them here, and their involvement in the arts, if you could. Thanks. Okay, uh, my mother uh, was born in Makawili, Kauai, Camp 13. <laughs> uh, she came with my uh, grandfather, who was a, uh, he had a brother who was a Methodist uh, missionary. And uh, my grandfather accompanied him. He was kind of a lay missionary. And they came with the first uh, Filipino plantation workers into Hawaii, because uh, they harvest the pineapple in, in Hawaii, and so they, that's how they came. My grandfather is also re, uh, responsible for uh, uh, building Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. I looked at the diary of my mother, and he took many, and then he came here. He was also the close friend of the Illustrissimo family. The Illustrissimo family is a very unique family because they produce four good brothers. They produced two famous nephews. One was Flora Villabreo, and the other one was was uh, Tati Illustrissimo, the heads what we call Carlos Illustrissimo. Uh, so my, uh, on that side, he was also, my grandfather was also on the Filipino constabulary. Uh, he lied about his age and went in age 13 and stayed till up in 18. So that's how he came in, I see, because he was under the American occupation. The Americans formed Philippine Scouts and they also formed the Filipino constabulary. Philippine, Filipino constabulary is sort of like the uh, French Foreign Legion of America because all the officers were Caucasian but they were German, uh, they were French, they were Spanish, uh, maybe an occasional token Filipino, and, but the, all the men were Filipino. And uh, it was an outstanding job that, that they did for the American occupation, that's the constabulary. Uh, so my father came on the, uh, what they call, he's called a pensionado. They were, uh, they were to be trained in America and to co go back to the Philippines and teach the Filipinos the American way of life. But my, but my father married my mother, so he stayed in the United States. Uh, so, but uh, it's, uh, that's, that's the his, history of, uh, of my, fa my father. He's very intelligent. He was a barrio principal under the American uh, principal. But when he got, got to America, he couldn't teach uh, because his accent was so thick. So he went in more into agriculture work and became a, a, a foreman. Uh, it, the, the, the Filipinos of that time period really experienced hardship. My, my aunt, uh, which is the youngest sister of my mother, is the first Filipino teacher. It's no big deal now because so many Filipino teachers. But at that time it was. She's the first Filip Filipino teacher uh, in the state of California. My sister is the second, and my mother's the third. But nowadays there's so many Filipino teachers, it's no big thing. But in those days it was a big thing, you know. And so, uh, that's what made it so hard on me, because they said, you've got to finish school. <laughs> and I wasn't much of a student, but I managed to struggle through. <laughs> but uh, that's the short history of my family. Uh, m my aunt did go to school with Jackie Robinson, you know, uh, which I thought was kind of, and, and Kenny, uh, uh, Kenny Washington, who, they were both All-American at UCLA at that time. It was a different, it was a different America. It was, uh, they uh, weren't so cosmopolitan those days, and probably not as, uh, uh, tolerant of other races, uh, nationalities. It's a different American now. But at that time, the, uh, they went through a lot of hardship. I know my aunt did. 